Hi, my name is Randall Loy. I want to welcome you back again to the Infertility Channel. Today we're going to be talking about one of those big topics in reproductive medicine. It's called endometriosis. Endometriosis is where the uterine lining glands are actually growing outside of the uterus in the pelvis. One of my patients has even called these pelvic pimples because they can stud the pelvis and abdomen and they're like little inflammatory growths that respond to ovarian hormones. This disease was first described by a German physician, Dr. Daniel Schoen, in 1690, but it was not until the 19th century, 1860 exactly, that Dr. Karl von Rokotansky further described this disease and realized that these glands here are moving out and causing problems at different places in the pelvis. Now, what are these symptoms of endometriosis? Typically, patients report to our practice with pain with menses, pain with intercourse, pain with bowel movements, pain with urination, or chronic pain may be lasting every day. And they typically describe this pain as nagging, drawing, pulling, cramping, dull, poorly localized pain. Oftentimes it'll radiate into the thighs, the front parts of the thighs, or into the back or to the hips, but it is a pain that's like no other. So how does endometriosis, how do these glands cause problems inside of the belly? Well, they can cause scar tissue, they can lead to an increased elaboration and accumulation of white blood cell hormones called cytokines, which are very inflammatory. And they can also cause growth of new blood vessels and growth of new nerves. In addition, those lesions can grow deeply around the nerves of the pelvis, causing profound pain. One of the ways that we believe that endometriosis causes infertility is that it can distort the anatomy. Scar tissue can cause those fallopian tubes to be stuck up against the walls or completely enwrapping the ovaries or around the bowel loops. It can cause infertility also, we believe, by the accumulation of those white blood cell hormones, cytokines, in the gravity-dependent spaces of the pelvis. By that, I mean the cul-de-sac, this little cup-shaped area about the size of your hand into which you ovulate and into which the sperm are residing within minutes of ejaculation. So that cul-de-sac area can get filled up with this fluid that's very hostile and very angry toward the sperm and the eggs. So we believe that the sperm and egg lifespan is decreased by this hostile fluid. One of my patients called it her Drano pelvis. It's not quite liquid Drano, but it's not very encouraging to the sperm and eggs. Several studies, especially one in 1988, suggested that women with endometriosis might have an increased risk for other diseases, such as chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, underactive thyroid gland and autoimmune diseases. Another has suggested there might be an association with asthma and certain cancers, especially ovarian cancers. Now, a little bit about the genetics of endometriosis. If you have a first degree relative, a mom or a sister with endometriosis, you have a six fold higher chance of having endometriosis yourself. The genetic predisposition for this disease seems to reside on the long arm of the number 10 chromosome and the short arm of the number seven chromosome. We do know that there's probably an epigenetic phenomenon associated. Now we've talked about epigenetics in a previous episode, but that's where certain molecules latch onto and unhitch from the DNA, causing differential responses of that gene. So endometriosis may in fact not be a disease so much as just an epigenetic phenomenon. Just another word about whether endometriosis is in fact a disease. It could be a modern phenomenon. If you think about it, through most of human history, reproductive age women were either pregnant or lactating, breastfeeding their entire adult lives. In an age of contraception and delayed childbearing, we have cycle after cycle of menstrual blood and glands refluxing up through the fallopian tubes, and it maybe just overwhelms the immune system. So it does have links to autoimmunity, but we think of it both as a genetic predisposition with environmental as well as immune switches, triggers that cause the disease to kick in gear. So it could be a threshold hypothesis. In other words, we don't have endometriosis until we cross a certain level, a number of months perhaps, of these glands and blood refluxing through the tubes. Now a little bit about the theories, because we don't know exactly how endometriosis is caused. One of the prevailing and probably the most popular theories is one of the refluxed menstrual blood, so-called retrograde menstruation. Now we know that probably 100% of women actually put blood up into the pelvis every month with their periods, 
and most of those women 90 plus percent are able to clear that blood every month no problem but let's say that a woman has a very tight and closed cervix she is therefore refluxing more of that blood up in the pelvis and classic studies on baboons have shown that if their cervixes are closed they do develop endometriosis that's also been shown in humans by some harvard studies another theory is salomic metaplasia salomic is the progenitor cell or the mother of both uterine glands as well as the membrane, the peritoneum. So it's possible since these two daughter cell types are so closely related that the membrane type cells can be converted into uterine lining cells. Another one is called Mullerianosis. The Mullerian system is the female reproductive system. From eight to ten weeks of gestational age when you were a baby inside of your mom, your uterus was coming down and those uterine glands were pulling into place and it's possible along that track that endometrial glands, menstrual glands, were actually studying the lining of your pelvis. Those can grow up later on and cause endometriosis. So the last theory is called vasculogenesis. That's a big word. It means that new blood vessels are growing in and it turns out that these little inflammatory pimple-like lesions can actually encourage new blood vessel ingrowth which causes this to be sort of self-propagating. This little lesion can make more of itself. A little bit about the diagnosis. Whereas a magnetic resonance scan can be suggestive of endometriosis or an ultrasound scan can be suggestive of endometriosis, the gold standard of diagnosis is laparoscopy. Now laparoscopy, you'll recall, is where there's a metal tube that goes in through the belly button typically and we look around and we're able to use different instruments to not only biopsy but to vaporize or ablate or destroy those uterine glands. Once we get inside with the laparoscope, we're able then to see the endometriosis. It can look like little water blisters. It might be flat, colored patches. It can be black, it can be blue, it can be yellow, it can be orange, it can be about any color. It can be nodular, rounded, it can be deep or superficial. Sometimes it forms cysts in the ovaries that look like Hershey's syrup. We call those chocolate cysts or endometriomas. That's pretty graphic, but sometimes those cysts have to be removed to relieve the pain or to improve fertility. So what about staging? How do we know how bad the disease is? It goes from stage one to four. Minimal, mild, moderate, and severe. Minimal disease means that there might be some superficial disease spots here and there, maybe a few flimsy adhesions. Stage two usually means that there's deeper disease plus some superficial disease. Stage three means that there's deep ovarian endometriosis, that chocolate cyst, and stage four would imply all of the above plus dense adhesions, dense scar tissue bands, just kind of gumming up the works and sometimes even obliterating the space between the back of the uterus and the rectum. So is there any way to know about endometriosis besides laparoscopy? Is there a tried and true blood test? Well, I and others in the past have looked at different markers and you are probably familiar with one called CA-125, which is the Gilda Radner test and that is a marker of ovarian cancer that is sometimes applied to endometriosis. It's not a very specific marker. It's increased with certain cancers such as ovarian and bowel cancers, uh, pancreatic disease, smoking, other inflammation. So it's not a very good test, but it is sometimes used as a general marker for the amount of disease and the response to disease. So that's a lot about the diagnosis of endometriosis. I would like to leave you with a story that kind of is a segue into the treatment of endometriosis. I had a couple in their mid-20s, newlyweds, and I treated her for endometriosis, and she was feeling very much better. Intercourse was no longer a problem. So they went out camping one weekend, and they were frolicking out in the woods. It turns out, though, that she slipped off the blanket onto a bed of poison ivy. He did as well. They came in that following Monday asking for relief. And she says, you know, this is a lot like the burning I used to have with endometriosis. All of a sudden, it was like a light bulb went off in her husband's head. He said, oh, honey, I never knew it was this bad. <laughs> anyway, true story. Thanks for joining us today at the Infertility Channel. And please tell your friends to subscribe. If you have any comments of a personal nature that you don't want everybody to see, please email me at the address below. Thanks so much. See you next week.